I think just being able to zoom out and zoom in effectively is going to make you such a more uh, capable leader and business owner um, because you have to be able to switch gears. It's Dan Habercost here along with Mason McDonald. Welcome to the Big Picture Blueprint. Today, we're going to talk a little bit about lead measures in your business. And this this topic came up because I did a talk at my real estate group last week and, and Mason was there where I showed how to take goals and break them down into monthly, weekly, and even daily lead measures and to create a feedback loop. So not only do you know that you're doing the things you need to do every day to hit your goal, but you're measuring them to get a better understanding of the amounts of those things you need to do to hit whatever metric you're trying to hit. So that's what we're talking about today. But Mason, first, how you doing? Dan, I'm doing great. Uh, you know, I think this topic is going to be a fun one to talk about. I think we're going to be able to really, you know, break down what a lot of people will say that makes you feel good about goals and, you know, take some of the jargon out of this goal setting and make it really easy to understand. So where you're able to take immediate action and control the steps to drive your business to really, really high levels of success. So I, I think this is going to be fun. Um, excited for it. Yeah, yeah, me too, me too. And let's just jump right into it. So, all right, Mason, so I'm setting out to make a hundred grand my first year flipping land. Where do I start? Yeah, Dan, I, I, I think that's one, that's a great goal to have, but I think we need to back up and set some definitions and create some definitions first. And just like we talked about a little bit in the intro, you know, let's talk about lead measures and what that actually means and then lag measures and what that means. So a lead measure is an input measure. It means we can directly control that. And that measure is going to be something or that goal or that tactic, whatever you want to call it, is going to be something you can directly control that allows you to achieve whatever those lag measures are. Uh, during your, your meetup um, group presentation, I think you used weight loss mm -hmm. as a great example of defining it um, where if you said, I want to lose a hundred pounds, that's amazing. That's a lag measure. But the lead measure is, okay, well, what's your calories uh, that you're consuming? How much exercise are you getting? That kind of stuff. And that's what you focus on. So just like with that, with um, an objective, like I want to make a hundred thousand dollars, what are the key results to get there? And you yeah. can kind of work backwards from that moment to figure it out. So with land flipping specifically, okay, I've got this lag measure or objective is what I call it. Um, I've got this objective of making $100,000. And in order to make $100,000, I need a certain amount of deals. And in order to get a certain amount of deals, I need a certain amount of leads. And in order to get a certain amount of leads, I need to send out a certain number of marketing campaigns. And that right there, when you get back to that actionable step to get started, is the lead measure that we're going to focus on. So that's where we would start. And so from there, you can kind of create those tactics of, okay, for, for me, I only use direct mail in my campaign. So how much mail do I need to send to get a lead? How many leads do I need to have to get a deal? How many deals do I have to get to make $100,000 is the way I think about it. Yeah, no, that's a great explanation there, Mason. And I, I like what you said. And kind of the beauty of this whole conversation is working backwards. So you, you can do anything you want. It's just a matter of working backwards. And that concept um, is really exciting to me. And so starting with the goal, I think there's a few parameters we should mention. So you, you, you hit on this a little bit, but a hundred thousand dollar net income goal fits the characteristics of it's in a set timeline. It's specific. Uh, and it's, it's, it's quantifiable, right? It's not vague. It's not, I want to improve my systems in business, or I want to get better at, you know, uh, running or, or something vague. It is specific. It's in a set timeline and it's easily measured and tracked. Um, and so your goals that you start with need to fit those, those few cure characteristics there, and then you can work backwards. And so, all right, we're going to take yours of a hundred K in land. Uh, you want to actually talk through what that would look like with the numbers you have in your business or we have in our business. Yeah, absolutely. So um, lo love what you said. You know, it goes back to the jargon we kind of talked about, um, the SMART goals of the specific, measurable, achievable, relevant, and time-bound um, of which, 
okay, I want to make $100,000 in a year flipping land. That's perfect. So we've got that objective. And now from that key result, uh, okay, so for me personally, I get a deal about every 800 letters that I send, you know, and so, you know, the, the additional metrics that I talked about before, you know, we don't even have to dive into those, you know, mm -hmm. walking down the chain. So if I send 1600, I'm going to get about two deals and my deal size is extraordinarily variable. So my average deal size is probably closer to 40 or 50,000 per deal, but my median deal size is more like 12,000. And I think that's an important distinction that we need to make in this business. Yes. We'll talk about statistics all the time on this show where it doesn't matter where, you know, I've gotten a deal where I've made $161 and I've gotten a deal where I've made $150,000 mm -hmm. where, you know, that right there, that's not enough data to really show anything. So you yes. really need to be focusing on the median whenever you have a really small sample size. So assuming that I'm making about $10,000 per deal, um, you know, we're, we're going to use these numbers because math is hard. Uh, and it takes a thousand letters to send to get one deal to make um, ten thousand dollars. You know how many deals do I need to, or how many pieces of mail do I need to send? Um, I'm not going to pull out my calculator, but uh, to me that means I need to send out ten thousand mailers. Yep, which is going to cost me about fifty seven hundred dollars. And if I spend fifty seven hundred dollars, that's going to make me a hundred thousand um, dollars. You know, this is in a perfect world, obviously, but I think that right there is such an easy objective um, mm -hmm. to achieve whenever you break it down that way. Um, so I think, uh, you know, if you were to be setting your goals of like, okay, well, I need to send 1,000 pieces of mail every single week or every single month, depending on what your budget is and what you can afford. Um, and that is going to help allow you to achieve it. But going back to what I said, I said, on average, I get a deal per thousand, but you know, yeah. sometimes I'll send 2000, 4,000, 5,000, not get a single deal. And sometimes I'll send a thousand, get five deals. So it's uh, about maintaining consistency, which is something we'll have to dive into. Yeah. Let me, let me hit on that. Cause that this is something that I see not well understood so frequently with business people. Uh, I, I think I told the story of there's a, a uh, private equity investor, investor, think of him similar to Warren Buffett. I like to read his memos he puts out and he wrote an article about or used an analogy of the the six foot man that drowned crossing the river that was five foot deep on average and averages are not reality at all yeah no and just like you said if you have a small sample size averages are meaningless if you're sending a million mailers a month you'll probably get a good useful average but you know i'm sending about ten thousand mailers a month even that really isn't enough to get a good average. So averages are not reality and you need to be prepared upfront to, to not get that average until you've been executing for a long period of time, right? Go back to high school, you know, the law of large numbers. If I take a sample of 10 random men in the US and look at their height, I could have a bunch of people that are 6'4". If I take 10 million men and sample their height, I'll probably get a very good representation of the average. So same thing applies to marketing uh, in your business. Uh, but I'll pause for a moment there, Mason. Yeah, no, absolutely. I, I, I think that makes so much sense where uh, it's about maintaining consistency over a long period of time to achieve a sample size that gives you meaningful data. Yep. And I think um, before we kind of really dive into where you should start pivoting if your lead metrics are not actually... Um, you know, adjusting your lag metrics, you know, say, you know, in this business, and I, I think this is the perfect example of the most simple lead and lag metric of number of marketing pieces to uh, actual deal or to actual dollar amount from a net income perspective, where, um, you know, if you've sent 10,000 letters and you've kind of heard consistently that, hey, people are usually getting, you know, 10 or 20 responses per thousand and one to two deals per thousand, and you haven't gotten a single response, that might be something that we have to adjust and change. But yeah, I think, um, you know, really, really focusing on the definition of the metrics that you're using is so crucial whenever you're starting a business, because I think, you know, just like you said, towards the beginning, I think a lot of people are going to set strategic goals and I think they're going to have strategic 
ideas associated with the metrics they're tracking. And what I mean by that is so often where I've talked to people wanting to get started in business or, you know, in my previous role, you know, managing individuals where, you know, we would have that, we would have those objectives. Um, okay, this quarter, we're going to achieve this goal. And these are the key results we need to actually get to that objective where some of those key results would say, I'm going to think about doing this, or I'm going to think about doing that. And if you're thinking about something, that means you actually don't really have control over it. Uh, so you need to really, really hammer that point home of if you cannot control it, and if there is not an actual deliverable result for the lead measure, meaning I, you know, want to improve, you know, patient satisfaction scores in a hospital. And I can see that it's food scores on the patient satisfaction survey that's going to do it. You know, what you need to do from a lead measure standpoint is your lead measure can't be like, talk to someone about this. It's you need to actually go and do something. Um, so I, I just want to hammer that point home where if you are not focusing on those lead measures that you can actually control. It doesn't really matter. But um, Dan, I kind of want to talk about when do you, you know, what is a large enough sample size to determine whether or not you need to pivot your, your lead measures? You know, if you sent 10,000 letters and you didn't get a single response, is that something that you should pivot? Or how would you approach that if you sent 10,000 letters and hadn't got a single response in your land business? Great question and great uh, uh, transition to what I want to talk next about, which is tracking and iterating and adjusting. And so the idea of what we're trying to do here is create a feedback loop so that you can verify whether your assumptions around X input equals you know X output are correct. Maybe they're high, maybe they're low. And so what I do in my business is uh, my CRM Pebble has a, uh, a method for just tracking responses. So I get total responses for every campaign. But then I just have a separate sheet where for each campaign, I track exactly how many deals we got out of it and then the net profit off of each one of those deals. And unfortunately, as much as we'd love the sales cycle to be a month or two, that's just not reality. So at the end of every month, I go six months in arrears and I look at those mail campaigns from six months ago. And of those campaigns, what ultimate result did I get? Was it 500 mailers for a deal? Was it 1,500? And then deal is kind of arbitrary because a deal could be a 2k profit it could be a $200,000 profit so ultimately i looked back at for how many mailers did it take to make you know x dollars right did i did i get 10 grand out of 1000 or did it get 100 grand and so looking back for several different markets and several different campaigns helps give me a better point of reference and know whether i should move elsewhere and so um I don't have a clear number for you as far as, hey, X amount is an appropriate sample size because I'm in a bunch of different markets that have different amounts of people I can mail. But um, on average, I mean, I, I want to see at least a 10 to 1 return, right? If I, if I spent $1,000, we need to have netted at least 10 grand. And even that, honestly, in this business isn't great. Um, but to make this more practical for the newbie, I would start with 10 times the metric. So if I expect 1,000 mailers to get one deal, start by sending 10,000 mailers. And if you get nothing, then yes, something is wrong. It's not just a matter of, of not saying enough volume. There, there is something wrong, whether it's your sales methodology or your, your mailers or something there. Um, that's how I do it. And, and that is really helps too, because so often, especially because the sales cycles are longer in this business, you don't realize um, how different the response and ultimately the income you're getting from different markets is. So six months in arrears, once a month, I do my numbers. No, and and you caught on to my trick question where I, I said, you know, if you send 10,000 mailers, when do you decide to do it? But I didn't say how long I've been sending the 10,000 mailers, which is why what you're talking about is so important of you know, w when you're focusing so much on a zoomed in tactic of this lead metric of I'm going to send X number of, you know, pieces of mail, where if you send 10,000 pieces of mail all at once, um, you should start to worry after your established timeline is going way beyond 
what is expected. And what I mean by that is just like Dan is saying, you need to figure out how much time there is in between your lead measure and your expected lag measure where, okay, well, you know, if I send a thousand pieces of mail, you know, first off, did, you know, and we'll, we'll get into some of the technicals here of, okay, first off, did you send it first class or standard class? Because if you send it first class, you know, maybe it'll take a week or so um, until it's actually sent because uh, the mail house has to print it. Uh, they have to actually stamp it and send it out and everything like that. So if you give it one to two days there and you're, you're, you're at seven days now um, of when people actually start receiving the mail for first class, if you had done standard class, it might be several weeks. Um, and so, okay, well, people got it. And are they going to respond right away or are they going to put it in the mail pile on the kitchen counter and then go back and look? Where for me, if I send a campaign first class, I expect to start getting responses usually two and a half to four weeks after I've actually sent the campaign. So from there, and, and that being said, I've gotten responses a year later from sending campaigns, uh, depending on what people do. And the point I'm trying to make there is, okay, well, you know, Typically, it takes about this much time to respond. And if we're so focused on being zoomed in on, you know, these lead measures, don't expect the instant gratification you feel after you achieve one of those lead measures. It's called a lag measure for a reason. And, you know, where it's like, okay, well, it takes three weeks for people to actually start responding. Once people start responding, it might take a few weeks to actually lock up a deal. And then it takes another week or two, you know, to get it closed. And so from... From that point, we're two months after sending a piece of mail before actually getting a deal. And you know, it takes X number of deals. And then, you know, say the sales cycle is in between, you know, maybe it takes 30 days to 120 or 180 days on the market. And then a 30 to 45 day close when you actually go under contract up, you might not actually see any of those lag measures achieved until six months after um, you execute on a lead measure. So you think about it from the standpoint of like, okay, well, I'm not going to get any results from my January work until July. And by setting that expectation up on the back end and being very conservative with it, you're able to operate more. But that gets difficult when you are a newbie and you need this money to be coming in rapidly. And that's a different metric that you have to achieve of, okay, well, you know, with this type of business, if the expected, you know, timeline from whenever you do that initial both, you know, financial investment or capital investment into the mail, as well as sending it out is going to take that long. How are you going to drive business in that? And the only way to do it, if this is your meat and potatoes business is to be constantly focusing on those lead measures. So, yeah. um, yeah, Dan, I, I think, um, I think we can beat this horse horse to death about how important it is to be consistent on focusing on your lead measures. Um, and how to set realistic expectations of the timeline of whenever your lag measures are going to be achieved. But um, how do you not stay focused on your lag measures whenever you need to be making money? How, how do you, you know, emotionally, like on a personal level, do that? Yeah, it, it's hard to do. And I think there's a couple uh, thoughts I have. Number one, just experience it makes it easier over time. It does get easier over time because once you've gone through the ebbs and flows of business for the, over the course of your years, it just becomes more normal. Number two, um, keeping a good amount of reserves. And as a corollary to that, keeping your finances in check when you have really good months, if you make a hundred grand, don't go spend a hundred grand, right? Don't inflate your lifestyle to match the uh, really strong months, keep it in check and keep proper reserves. And, you know, emotionally, it's, it, it can be challenging to do. There are rough months. There's no getting around that. But just keeping the big picture in mind, and again, especially have you done the, as you've done this more and more, realizing, oh, hey, uh, last time this happened and I kept my lead measures up, what do you know? I got a regression to the mean three months later and I, I made two times what I normally make, three times what I normally make. So it's just a matter of as you said, of consistent execution of the lead measures and having those prioritized on your calendar every single day. Um, so I don't have an, a, a perfect solution to the uh, emotional ups and downs that come with any business, but just knowing and, and keeping the big picture in mind uh, and focusing accordingly is the best solution I've found. And one more thought uh, on that as well, 
or on your last point, sales cycle was the word I was looking for. And guys, whatever business you get into, you need to know the sales cycle. You know, when I did my talk, I thought about the realtors or the, the loan officers in the room and that sales cycle could be two years. You can meet a perfectly qualified client. It could be two years. And with land specifically, I don't think it's pitched properly where there's a lot of people selling selling land, selling land courses uh, about making money tomorrow. And that's not really how this business is best done. You can make it happen like that via assignments, but that's not uh, a great way to go about it if you don't have to, because if you're leaving money on the table, you're doing more work than is necessary and a more proper expectation is you know, a three to nine month sales cycle. So I'll pause there. Yeah, no, I, I, you're right on, you're right on. And I think, you know, regardless of, you know, how you cope with it from an emotional standpoint where, um, it's, I, I used to use this metaphor a lot whenever I was managing the hospital and, you know, for, for anyone that's a hunter out there or, you know, shoot ski, uh, you know, I talk about it from the standpoint of, you know, if you're, if you're dove hunting and, you see a bird flying towards you. You are looking out at the whole picture of the scene. You've zoomed out from it. And then when you know it gets into this window, that's when you zoom in and you take your shot. And the that's so necessary to do in business because otherwise you're going to be so defeated all the time if you're just focusing on your lag measures or you're just focusing on your lead measures where, you know, I, I had no sales in the month of May. Now I bought a lot of property and so, you know, it's going to happen and it's going to feel really good, but I can look back and see, okay, well, May was an off month, but I had a great April and a fantastic January and February. And in May I was feeling depressed because I was like, I, what am I doing? Like, I don't have money coming into the business. I haven't made any sales. You know, I'm still getting paid on owner finance deals and I've got, you know, consulting work that's paying my bills and everything, but I had no sales. And now in June, you know, I'm, I've got property selling and, you know, going into the summer, I'm going to have property selling. And I look back and I look back two years ago at my life and I'm like, wow, I would have killed two years ago to be faced with these problems of, hey, man, you've got half a million dollars, you know, sitting on the books right now that are that's going to be coming in, you know, when these properties sell. And I think just being able to zoom out and zoom in effectively is going to make you such a more a uh, capable leader and business owner um, because you have to be able to switch gears, especially if you're where Dan and I are, which is, you know, we, we're, we're business owners, but we're still self-employed. We're so involved in the working in the business. Mm -hmm. um, we're not just working on the business. And so when you get too caught up on the lead measures, zoom out and focus on working on the business to allow you to, you know, have the sustainable systems and processes and procedures in place to allow you to, you know, automate some of those lead measures. And that's something cool that you can do in this business too, is, you know, the, the process of focusing on my lead measures, it only takes me an hour or two per week. And that right there is insane to think that that hour or two per week can make me a million dollars in a year. Yeah. Um, yeah. but you know, the, the, this is so applicable to all businesses. It's not just land. It's every aspect of, you know, whether it's real estate investing or, you know, my background in healthcare or anything like that. But um, I think uh, in terms of defining a more complex lag metric of, you know, something that, um, you know, to, to kind of pivot a little bit on focusing on a lag metric associated with the actual business rather than, you know, financial goals. Uh, something that, um, you know, I've been working towards in my business is, okay, I'd like to automate my business in its entirety by the end of the year with a goal that, or a strategy or an objective that's kind of that complex, Dan, how would you change your approach, if at all, to defining a lead metric for something like that? Yeah, that's a that's a little more complex. And so, again, it needs to be broken down into practical steps. And so I would first start by putting everything on paper that I'm still doing in the business that I want to offload. And I would define it in its entirety, right? Create a simple job description, or maybe it's one job with a variety of tasks. I'm, I'm not sure the volume of the work, but put it on paper, make it clear, quantifiable, d definable, and then assign, all right, do I need one employee for this? Two, three, is this something my, my existing employees can do? Figure that out. And then you have a blueprint more or less of what needs done, how many people you need to do it. And then you can set 
metrics around hiring and training. And maybe there needs to first be a metric. Well, I need to get to a certain level of profitability before I'm actually working on this daily. But once it is clearly defined exactly what needs done, how many people you need to do it and what that costs, you can then make a decision on when this is financially viable. And maybe it is immediately. And if that's the case, then I would set lead measures around interviewing. And then once you've hired the right amount of people for those roles, I would have lead measures around training to get them to the point where they can execute those tasks, those roles without input from you. That's how I do it. Yeah. You, I, I think you said it, um, very succinctly there. And I think, um, one thing that I've kind of recognized in my business is there's, uh, you know, positive tactics and negative tactics. Mm -hmm. And I don't mean that in like a positive feel good way or negative feel bad way. It's more about addition versus removal where sometimes whenever I'm operating and trying to figure out how to approach these more complex objective in the bi objectives in the business, I will think about it from like an emotional standpoint of, okay, what is causing me stress in the business? And it'll be like, okay, well, you know, to give a personal example of, you know, I, I purchased, uh, got half a million dollars worth of real estate last month. And I needed to raise $300,000 in about a week to purchase the, to these two properties. And that right there, I was like, okay, this is stressing me out. How do I remove this stress in the short term and the long term? And, um, and it's boiling it down to those lead metrics of, okay, well, I'm going to call, um, you know, 10, in, 10 investors every single day until I can raise that money. And then in the long term, how do I do it so where I never have to feel that way again? Because that's the worst thing in the world. It's having to feel like you have to scramble all the time. And it's, okay, well, I'm going to add two investors into my investor book every single week. Um, so I know that it is now an automated process. It's part of my standard operating procedure of, okay, if it's a deal size this, this big, I create this and I send it to these people and I know one of them are going to do it. Um, and I think it's that removal of pain in a process that you can actually turn into a lead measure um, that's really allowed me to flourish in my business because now I'm not as stressed about things because everything has a process associated with it. And getting down and creating processes is something that's going to help you feel better. And if you feel better, you can do better business and it's going to help you actually you know, sustain your business in a more effective, efficient, um, and income-producing way. Yep. So. Uh, next thing I kind of want to move towards, Dan, is you can set all these goals all day, but God, if it's just you holding yourself accountable, um, you know, I've, I've been to the gym and it's been leg day and, uh, you know, you, my gym partner haven't been there and my leg workouts, whenever you're not there, is a <laughs> lot different, sure. um, you know, and, uh, so how, you know, Talk, let's, let's talk about the power of accountability partners and kind of why it's so crucial for you to have an accountability partner in your business and what it's done for you and your business. And we can talk, talk a little bit about what it's done for me and my business too. Sure, sure. So having some form of accountability is essential. And this is going to differ a little bit depending on your personality. But, um, you know, Mason and I do this and help each other here. But I, I think it's important that you have someone who is it too far ahead or behind. You don't want someone who's just starting a business. If you have an established business and they think honor grads a lot of money and you're trying to make a million, uh, that's not so good that they don't have the proper perspective to hold you accountable. They need to be, you know, close to where you are at and their goals need to be just as big, if not bigger than yours. And by that same token, if you're trying to make a million dollars, you don't want to go talk to someone who's working on it. And so that's why it works well for Mason and I. And on a, on a practical level, what do we actually do? How do we do it? Well, we have all our goals shared, and then we have our corresponding lead measures shared and an outline of how they're supposed to be executed every week. And so every Monday, he and I meet. We talk through whether or not we hit all of our metrics for each one of our lead measures for the corresponding goals um, and, and talk through any sort of problems with them, problems in the business, give each other uh, insight and solutions from a know, third party perspective. And that is incredibly helpful well, from an accountability standpoint, but also just from an objective advice standpoint, because it's so easy to look at someone else's business, especially if it's a business you're in and know what they need to do. It's hard to do that with your own because you're emotional about it. It's your business. And we often joke 
uh, that I should just tell him what to do every week and he should tell me what to do every week because it's much easier from the outside perspective. So yeah, that's been really, really powerful. Um, and there's a lot of versions of that could be your spouse for some people, a friend, a business partner. Uh, but what Mason and I do works, works very well. So some version of that, I, I think everyone listening should implement. Absolutely. And, and Dan talking to someone and creating an accountability partner where they're, they're at a similar level to you is so crucial because it's the idea um, you know, it's the idea of the Peloton of we're always either pushing or pulling the someone forward. And, you know, so a Peloton in its original sense, it's like a biking terminology of, you know, you've got someone in the front um, and then the person in the back comes around and is the leader. And that's constantly happening. You know, if you ever ran cross country, which uh, based on my cardio health, I, I did actually run cross country, believe it or not. Um, you know, it doesn't show anymore, but uh, it's you know, with Dan and I, where we're always kind of pulling ahead of each other, mm -hmm. um, makes it really exciting because, uh, we, we don't view each other as competition. We both want the other person to succeed, but I'm competitive as a person. And so, you know, it, it'll be funny where it'll be like, okay, you know, net revenue in the pipeline is a, a goal that we track or an objective that we track of, you know, I think in the first quarter of this year, both of our goals were, well, not both of our goals. My goal is to create three hundred thousand dollars worth of net revenue, you know, through acquisitions, and uh, Dan's goal is um, to create three hundred thousand and one dollar, <laughs> uh, which makes it which makes it really fun to be able to compete yeah. like that. And um, you you feel like a jackass if on Monday it's like, well, dude, you were working all week. You said you were going to send three thousand pieces of mail. Like, why did you not do it? Mm -hmm. And I think you know that that shame component component is really helpful. I think the comp competitive component is really helpful, but being able to do it with another person, um, similar age, uh, similar, you know, you know, character and, uh, similar goals in life in general makes it so much more beneficial because, you know, if you're outside of the industry and everything like that, it's not that it's not important to get those people's insights and perspective into the business, uh, because they're going to give you a different perspective than something you would get for the people that are, you know, just saying the same thing to you constantly. But, um, I can, I can tell you how powerful it is just being able to have that accountability partner, you know, with, with Dan and in general and how much it's made my business flourish because just like Dan joked about, of, uh, you know, we give each other the advice we already knew, you know, knew ourselves mm -hmm. of, I tell Dan stuff and it's like, dude, I know you know this. Yeah. And yeah. sometimes it's validating to get that external perspective of someone that is objective where, you know, I, I obviously want Dan to succeed, but it's, you know, it, if he doesn't succeed, it's not like I'm not going to be able to afford my mortgage or anything like that. So yep. I'm able to give him very objective, non-emotional advice that he knows, but might not listen to because I don't know, sometimes that internal voice is not as powerful as the external voice that you hear. So, uh, find yourself an accountability partner. Um, I think we can kind of wrap up the show with some final thoughts and summarize this where, you know, start out with the end in mind, you know, for real estate, I think it's a great idea to create a financial goal and then look all the way back and keep going back of, uh, you know, how do you create the most controlled lead metric that you can to focus on that you can do in your business every single hour, every day, every week. Um, to achieve that and then creating an established timeline of the lead to lag metric so your expectations are in line. Um, and if you can do that, you can succeed in any business. Um, and, you know, to, to leave you guys with just a book recommendation, uh, you know, from me before I pass it back to Dan, Measure What Matters by John Doerr. Uh, John Doerr is a venture capitalist. He invested in Google right at the beginning. He knows what he's doing and he has the OKR uh, methodology, which is objective and key results. And it's exactly what we're talking about. It's a very great, easy to read book that tells you everything that we need to do in our businesses to succeed at levels like Google has. Dan? Yeah. Thoughts? You know, I, I wouldn't add additional book recommendations. That was a form of procrastination for me when I was getting started was reading more than I needed to. So read that book or read 12 week year and then just do it. it it's really simple guys. Um, beyond that, uh, I don't think I have anything else to add. I think that was well said, Mason. So uh, I think we'll wrap it up there. Thanks for joining us. Uh, go out there, establish your lead measures and execute them relentlessly. Till next time, guys.